Hi, everyone. So this is another episode of Getting Everyone Moving, um, our weekly Palms of Pines Parasports uh, interviews with incredible people. And today we have Jen Poist, who is a Paralympian. Hey, Jen. Hi, Mike. So good to see you. Um, good to see you as well. Thank you. So why don't we start out with um, talking a little bit about your childhood and kind of how you got into adaptive sports. Sure. Um, so I was injured at the age of seven. I had a tumor on my spine that left me paralyzed. Um, and I got involved with sports, introduced to sports a few years later um, through a sports camp for kids with disabilities. So it's a summer sports camp and um, they introduce you to all different types of sports. Um, so I got introduced to basketball, swimming, um, tennis, uh, yeah, lots of different sports. I did a little bit of scuba diving, um, pretty much anything you can think of. They tried to get kids introduced to just to kind of see what your interests were, or, you know, what might fit. Um, and, you know, I got introduced to basketball at this camp and that was the sport that really stuck with me and I really, really liked. Um, couple, so I was probably about nine or 10 when I started going to that camp. Um, when I was in high school, I found a team in Baltimore, Maryland um, called the Bennett Blazers. And I played with them um, for all through high school for four years. I played basketball with them and I played sled hockey with them. Um, and that was when I really, you know, got involved with competitive adaptive sports. Um, as, as you're familiar with, Bennett's a pretty big program. Um, they travel all over the country. So I had that opportunity to kind of really get into basketball at a really competitive level, got to, to go to a lot of summer camps um, and just really learn the game a lot more. Um, yeah, so I played with them all through high school and then, you know, I got recruited to go to the University of Arizona where I played for nine years for that program. That's where I met you when you were helping out coaching that their team for a little bit. Um, yeah. How, how um, so thinking back, you know, to when you had this tumor, um, how did your, how have your parents supported you in, um, you know, just being really active and playing competitively and getting to the point of being a Paralympian? Honestly, my parents were huge in me getting to where I am and being so successful in sports. Um, it takes a lot from the parents, a lot of their time, a lot of their dedication to constantly drive you back and forth to practices. I mean, this is true of able-bodied kids as well, um, but even more so probably when you have a child with a disability because you know access to sports isn't as readily available. Um, so my mom often drove, you know, an hour, gave up, gave up her weekends and would drive, you know, an hour down to Baltimore to take me to practice or, and then an hour back on a Saturday and then sometimes turn around and do the same exact thing on Sunday as well. Um, if honestly, if I didn't have her doing that, like I wouldn't have been able to play. Um, so her commitment to seeing me succeed in that aspect was really huge. And it's something that I'll definitely, I appreciate very much. So the, the thing that I found, you know, in working with uh, youth with disability, um, and even as they get older, is that it's sometimes hard for parents to let go um, and let, uh, you know, the person, the individual just, um, you know, do their life. Um, do, do you think did your mom find that hard with you at all? Or, I mean, how did you kind of navigate all of that? Because you went, you grew up in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and then you came all the way across to Arizona. So, yeah, I, so my mom often says, I raised her to be independent. Sometimes I think I raised her to be too independent. <laughs> um, but she always had that mindset of, you know, I, I had to be my own person. I had to do what was best for me. Um, it's, it's really hard a lot of times when parents have kids with disabilities, they wanna protect them. Um, they don't wanna see anything more happen to them and they feel this need to protect them. And sometimes that prevents the kids from getting all the opportunity 
issues that they could have. Um, and, you know, but by her not having that mindset and really pushing me to do whatever I wanted to do, like it honestly made my life so much better. Um, and, you know, gave me all the opportunities to travel and play sports at all different levels. So, yeah, it's difficult for parents because, like I said, they feel that need to protect their kids, but there's so much good that can come out if they just let their kids do what they want and really push them to succeed. You know, one, I think one thing that I really learned uh, about in working with you and, and Pete and the University of Arizona women's wheelchair basketball team was that, you know, athletes are athletes, uh, no matter what. And so even today when I'm coaching, you know, I treat everyone's that you're an athlete, you know, and you're going to do what you need to do. So, you know, what advice do you have to coaches um, who um, are working with, um, you know, adaptive athletes? Just like you said, to treat them like any other athlete. I mean, there's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days. There's going to be things that one athlete can do that another one might struggle with. Um, but, you know, able body is the same way. You know, every, every person is different. Um, so you have to find what works for that person and that individual. Um, but it doesn't mean just because someone has a disability doesn't mean you necessarily lower your standards for them. There's, they're still a person and they still have great things that they can accomplish. You just have to figure out what that is. So you won, you, you won a gold medal in 2016. I did win a gold medal. What, I, I mean, how was that experience? Can you talk about it a bit? Winning a gold medal is probably the highlight of my athletic career, easily to say. Um, it was a great experience being part of Team USA. I was on Team USA for five years. Uh, I first made the team in 2012. That cycle, we did not medal. We unfortunately finished fourth. Um, so I honestly, I really in, appreciate and enjoyed the experience of going from not winning to winning. Like it honestly, it showed me how you work with other people and how you set goals and um, even though things don't go the way you always want them to, that like you still keep the end result in mind and that focus of, yes, things didn't work out, but we have, to, and there's X, Y, and Z that we need to fix. Um, and you just, you know, keep working towards that end site goal. Do you, do you yeah, know, I, go ahead. I was gonna say, winning, winning a gold medal in 2016 with the group that we won with was really special special like we all felt like we had a really tight bond um and you know that came from working so hard with each other for so many years um that group was like family to me and you know I still am really good friends with all of those athletes that were on the team um they'll always hold a special place in my heart just because it was such a you know I don't say monumental thing that we did but we you know, we all worked together for so long and had such a common goal that we wanted to achieve. And then to accomplish that with one another, like you just have that a greater appreciation for each other. Yeah, amazing achievement, just incredible. Um, talk about, so you participated in sports, you know, throughout your entire life. Um, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I came back to this country in 2016 was that there was a lack of collegiate uh, level athletics. I mean, I was amazed by the fact that there aren't a lot of, for example, wheelchair basketball programs. I mean, what is the importance of having collegiate level athletics, you know, for people, uh, you know, with a disability? I mean, it gives you the opportunity to continue in your athletic endeavors, obviously, but it also gives you um, a foundation to continue your athletic academic um, career as well and to just become you know to, to get a education um, and have a better career path ahead of you 
but then also it's the team aspect of things. And, you know, once again, having that group of people that you fit in with, um, that you can relate to that, you know, some, some athletes are still coping with their disabilities when they transition into college. So it honestly helps them largely with that, just being around other people in the same situations and seeing how they deal with it. Um, there, like you said, there are not a lot of collegiate athletic programs for wheelchair athletes. Um, and that's something that, you know, we always are trying to expand upon. It's really difficult for girls, um, for women. We just feel like there, it seems like there's not a lot of girls that want to leave where they're at and go and pursue their academic careers. Um, and I wish there were more, and that's one of my, you know, big pushes as being um, head of the women's division now is that we wanna see more girls continue on in their athletic and academic careers. Because like I said, it does really give them a really solid foundation um, and just that community aspect. Like I said, knowing other people that are in the same situation as you. I mean, I don't have kids personally, but I have plenty of friends now who have children. So whenever I, if ever I do have children, like I know I, can rely on them to ask them how they've dealt with this or that. Um, even when it comes to relationships and friendships and how do you deal with your family that might treat you different and those sort of like, it's just good to have a solid group of people who you can relate to and know what you're going through with things. And you mentioned you just became the chairperson of the uh, women's division for the National Wheelchair Basketball Association, which is, which is great. So what, yeah, what more do you hope to do in that position? Our biggest goal is to get more girls involved. Um, there's a lot of girls that just don't get involved with sports. Either they don't have access to it. Cause like I said, you know, it takes a lot of dedication from your family um, to get you there to practices often. That's one of the biggest barriers. Um, a lot of girls have a hard time. A lot of girls don't want to play contact sports. That's yeah. um, something we run into sometimes. But, you know, there's obviously like, you know, there's plenty of other options, but it's just getting those options available to them. Um, as far as basketball goes, like we're trying to get more girls involved and to see the benefit from having those friendships and those relationships um, and how basketball can, you know, get you to where I am in your life as far as helping with your education and making you an independent person and those. Um, yeah. Well, how do we, you know, how do we get more um, collegiate level programs? I mean, what are, are you as chairperson, are you going to be able to work on um, that kind of goal as well? That is kind of, yeah, like an offshoot of what our goal is. Um, there's a lot of girls in high school who are playing, but then don't continue on to college. Um, so we're gonna, we're definitely working on keeping that interest um, from high school to college. Um, it, there's, there's a lot of reasons why they don't continue on. Some of it has to do with, they just don't wanna move away from home. Um, so that's where having more programs all across the country would give them a lot more access. Um, so they don't have to move as far away from home. Um, it's a, it's a really, it's a, you know, it's a tough issue. I've, I've yes. spoken a number of times with people at College of the Desert where I live because in California, we don't have any collegiate level wheelchair basketball, which to me is just ridiculous. Um, and, you know, the thing that's said to me is, okay, it's about money, but, but the fact is you can still start a program. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money and, you know, it will actually, I think, encourage and attract more people who might use a wheelchair for mobility, you know, to come to the school and continue their education. So it, it is, it's a difficult, it's a difficult push, but I, you know, I just feel like it's so, so important. Um, I know recently didn't, a couple of kids from San Diego actually went to University of Arizona because there's nothing in California, right? Yes, yep, we have three girls on our team currently from San Diego. Um, 
and a couple guys as well. So yeah, yeah it's there. Yeah. California needs a team and they are trying to start one. Um, some of it's getting, you know, it's getting players to know about these things as well. Um, I can't tell you how many times I meet someone with a disability or, you know, other people I know meet someone with a disability and they've been disabled for 10 to 15 years and they have no idea about adaptive sports. So, you know, that's something that we as an adaptive sports community, I think need to do a better job at promoting ourselves and promoting the opportunities we have, which is why things like this are great, you know? Um, yeah, now you played- there still needs to be that outreach. You played with the Shield Maidens, which was based in California, right? Yes. Are they, they take in women and girls of all ages or how, how does that work? Yeah, so the women's division teams are women's and girls of all ages. Um, anyone, anyone, any female that wants to play basically. Um, so this, yeah, I played with the Shield Maidens for a couple of years, or for a year. Um, and then we started a team in Arizona the following year. So I now play with them. Um, but yeah, the women's division, that's anyone from high school to anyone who's 60 years old. Um, and some teams do have that wide range of athletes on them, which is really cool to see. Um, Are there women's teams throughout the entire country then pretty much? Or? Yes, yeah. um, but it's very limited. There's a, maybe 10 or 12 teams that rostered last year. Oh. Um, I don't exactly know how many are gonna end up rostering this full team this year that's grown a lot in the past couple of years because there was a point in time where we only had four or five teams that attended nationals. So it's definitely grown. Um, but like I said, it's just getting those girls interested and involved. One of the other things that we struggle with is a lot of girls will also play on men's teams, on co-ed teams. And then because they're competing with guys all the time, they kind of get discouraged um, but that's where women's basketball definitely plays a role because they're only competing against girl, other girls at that point. They don't have to worry about competing against the guys. Okay. Now, Jen, you, I mean, you've had a full life. I mean, you own a house, you're a pharmacist, you know, full-time job and all that. Um, you know, but a number of people that I know with a disability are just not doing, you know, they're, they're not doing much. Um, and do you have any idea as to why that is? I mean, is it lack of opportunity? Um, yeah. I, I think some of it is lack of opportunity. I think, it's, I think a lot of it is honestly not knowing what they can do. Um, like I was very fortunate to be introduced to adaptive sports at a really young age. And I met a lot of people through adaptive sports who had done a lot with their lives and gone on to, you know, hold successful careers. And I, so I saw that and was kind of able to emulate that. Whereas there's a lot of people that, like I said, they don't realize that there's this big community out there. And just, you know, because of that, they don't realize all the opportunities that are available and everything that they can do in their lives. Um, like you said, I'm a pharmacist. I know a few other pharmacists that are also in wheelchairs and, um, you know, having those role models in my life kind of helped me to realize that this is something I can do and never take no for an answer. Right. Yeah. But having you, I mean, you're a real role model. I mean, there's no, you know, doubt about that. And so I think especially again, for girls, um, you know, it's really important uh, for them to see you, you know, here's a successful woman, uh, you know, you play competitive sports and you've done well in life. And, you know, a lot of it, I think, or some of it has been, I mean, it sounds like your mom, you know, major influence. And I, I've seen that with some of the uh, girls that I've worked with within North Carolina, you know, their moms are taking them here and there and really supporting them. And it's, and also I've seen how sports can, um, it really helps people academically too, to some extent. Can you say something about that? I, I definitely think it helps a lot of people academically um, just because it gives you that focus. I mean, number one, like as a collegiate athlete, number one, in order to play, you have to make sure your academics are on par. 
Um, so it really makes you focus on keeping your academics together so that you can continue to play sports. I mean, even when I was in high school, I know if I would have gotten gr bad grades, my mom would have been like, nope, you're not going to practice this weekend. Um, so it really just keeps that focus on being successful and keeping everything in your life in order. Um, and then also because, you know, I wanted to go to college to play sports because that was, that was my goal and it, it looked so much fun. So I of course wanted to go to college to play, but I knew in order to get there, I needed to keep my academics up. Um, so, and yeah, being an athlete, it just gives you a lot of structure in your life. You know, if you wanna to go to practice on Saturday, you have to get all your academic work done on Sunday. Conversely, my athletes at U of A, they have practice every day of the week. So in order to keep up with that demand, like they have to stay on top of their academics because if they fall behind, then it's just going to be this, you know, domino effect type thing. Yeah. Well, and you know, I, when I think back about Tucson, I mean, very fondly, of course, um, such a supportive community, right? I mean, you know, people obviously like Mia, you know, and Pete, uh, Beardsley, you know, just, it's incredible how the university has really helped to cultivate this, uh, this real sense of community. And it's really, I think, you know, when you, when you walk, when you push at the University of Arizona campus, I mean, it's really, you know, barriers have been removed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, how, you know, how do we do that in other parts, you know, the country, I guess, Illinois is another place and in, Texas, where University of Texas, but how, how would you, I mean, you know, in your role now, in your new role uh, as chairperson, I mean, how would you kind of help to create more of those kind of environments? Yeah, I mean, so one of the biggest things I noticed when I first went to University of Arizona was honestly the number of people with disabilities, right? Mm -hmm. Like I never felt when I was on campus, like I was the only one there who had a disability. Like you always, when you're walking around, rolling around campus, you always run into someone else in a wheelchair um, or someone else using crutches or a scooter or whatever to get around. Um, so it's just that getting people with disabilities out into the community mm -hmm. um, so that they're not sitting at home um, and yeah, it's just getting exposure. Like, you know, like I said, I always felt like there was other people around me who had, were in the same situation as I was. Um, and so a lot of that comes from physical access. You know, University of Arizona is a very accessible campus. Um, yeah. We don't always have that in other parts of the country. Um, so that's sometimes a barrier for people uh, it's, it's one of those tough things as well. Um, but that's like when we invite people out to play sports with us, right? So we wanna make sure that they have what they need in order to make sure that they're successful right when they show up. You know, if they come and we don't have a chair that works for them or that sort of thing, like they're probably not gonna come back. Um, right. So it's, yeah, it's just having the resources available to people when thinking ahead of what might work um, for them, anticipating their needs sort of thing. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Jen. Do you have a few, uh, you know, parting words to uh, especially youth, you know, who have a disability and, you know, what they can accomplish, you know, in their lives? Um, I would just like to tell them to find something that they're passionate about whether it's sports, basketball, um, tennis, whether you're not, you like individual sports more, you know, you have to find what you're passionate about. I mean, music, art as well are great outlets for a lot of people. Um, something we probably don't touch on enough in the disabled community, but those are definitely great outlets as well. Um, but it's just finding something that you're passionate about and that you can use as an outlet to fuel whatever you want to do in your life. Um, you know, it's, it's always good to have something that gives you purpose.
And that's definitely something that I was able to find through basketball and sports was that purpose in my life of becoming a better person and helping other people through sports. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. This no has been problem. terrific and uh, stay tuned for another episode of Getting Everyone Moving.